thousand meters from the uh, Vissel plane. And so that means that these are fairly large structures. But if, of course, they break the surface, they're an island, not a seamount. Um, one of the reasons they're very interesting is that they have a good deal of information about marine biodiversity. They have a very different kind of substrate, which is typically basalt from lava flows. And so as a hard substrate in the deep sea, that's kind of a rare thing. And so there's a whole array of organisms that land on and attach to these seamounts that you don't find in the abyssal plains in the surrounding areas. Uh, they represent sort of islands, biological islands in the deep sea as well. And so there's a good deal of, uh, especially for the more isolated ones, a good deal of uh, endemism and potential either stepping stones for organisms to move one place to another or um, isolated hotspots for new biodiversity. But because many of the organisms that are attached to these seamounts are corals and sponges and things, they're also fragile ecosystems that could be harmed by uh, things like uh, deep water fishing. So how do seamounts form? There's three different geologic mechanisms, island arcs, mid-ocean ridge volcanoes, and mantle plume hotspots. The island arcs are really interesting because what you have is an oceanic plate that is subducting into uh, the mantle. And as that plate is moving into the mantle, it's melting. And so you have a trench where the subduction zone occurs. And then several miles, hundreds of miles away uh, from that trench is typically a series of volcanoes and islands, volcanic islands, that form from some of the lighter material that's melting from that oceanic plate. And here's an image of the Bonin Islands, also known as the Osagawa, Osagawara Islands of Japan. And you can see in blue here the, the trench, and then the islands themselves form this ridge of volcanoes and seamounts. Uh, several miles away from that. Uh, we see the same thing in the Caribbean. The Lesser Antilles are uh, a whole host of volcanic islands and volcanic seamounts. Uh, one of them here uh, near Grenada, known as Kikum Jenny, is one of the more active of the volcanoes. The mid-ocean ridges, the second way that you can form these is by spreading centers on the ridge and volcanoes forming from some of the um, magmatic activity that occurs on those ridges. The third form is uh, mantle plume hotspots. And we don't know a great deal about these mantle plumes and how they form, but they tend to be fairly long-lasting structures that blow a whole lot of very hot mantle material up into the crust and tend to form these islands and volcanoes. Um, but because the crustal plates are moving, they tend to form chains of islands and seamounts. And so the Hawaiian Islands and the Hawaiian Ridge and the Emperor Seamount Chain are actually one of these um, hotspots. The plume is right underneath the state of Hawaii at the moment. And the older and older islands and seamounts as you follow the chain back towards the Aleutian Trench. Um, currently, there's a new hotspot a volcano forming uh, east of the big island of Hawaii known as Loihi, and that's either going to be a seamount or the next Hawaiian island. And you can follow these, you can date the various uh, basaltic rocks along the, the chain and see that they're you know, older and older the further away you get from the, the hotspot itself. And it's not just the Hawaiian chain, there's uh, several other uh, mantle plume hotspot uh, chains that are in the Pacific. So we're still trying to figure out how many seamounts there are out there. Uh, the way that you can do this is using uh, satellite altimetry of the sea surface. Now the sea surface of course is 
is moving around and waves and everything. Uh, so to the eye, it doesn't look like you can really detect much of anything. But if you take the altimetry measurements over time and average the height of the sea, what you end up is removing all of the chaos of waves and swells and leaving you with the average sea surface altitude. And just like how there's often a bump in the water of a stream as it's flowing over a rock, the ocean water creates bumps at the surface. And so all of these dots on this particular map represent bumps at the surface that could be seamounts or lesser structures like knolls and hills and such, as well as mid-ocean ridges. And so the estimates are really wide ranging. Um, Alex Rogers just published a paper last year where he said it's anywhere from 170,000 to 25 million uh, based on these sea surface altimetry uh, analyses. Of those, only about 300 have been examined. And so we don't know a whole lot about seamounts, and there's apparently a lot of them out there. So um, there's more research to be done. And you can see in certain areas like the, the uh, Southern Pacific and Eastern Indian Ocean, people haven't actually looked at much of anything. So there's a lot more to be done. So the characteristics of seamounts, these really are mountains under the sea. And so this is Kelvin Seamount, uh, one of the seamounts in the New England Seamount chain that uh, we focused on. And I said they rise at least a thousand meters. Kelvin actually goes from uh, about 5,000 meters in the purple there to the um, a thousand meters or so in the red at the top. So that's a 4,000 meter spread. And so this seamount is something on the order of 12,000 to 13,000 feet high from the abyssal plain. And just to give you a sense of the size and scale of this, that flat top plateau right there that's in the, in the center of the seamount, that's five miles long. So these really are huge structures. So as far as these seamounts go with uh, regards to the ecology, there's a lot of invertebrate fauna that's typically filter feeders because there's a lot of hydrographic flow around these seamounts. And the enhanced flow means that filter feeding can be done faster and more efficiently. And so uh, we'll see all kinds of sea stars that pluck uh, plankton out of the water, corals, sponges, all sorts of other things. And those corals and sponges as attached invertebrates actually create structural diversity and habitat, uh, three-dimensional habitat. Um, for a long time, NOAA was reluctant to call these reefs, but they've since uh, relented and understand that these coral and sponge assemblages can form reefs on these uh, deep water areas. Given the structure of the seamounts, there's a lot of landscape variation, different depths, different substrates, because not only is there the basalt of the seamount itself, but there's a lot of sediment drifting down from the surface, uh, typically like planktonic organisms, shells and such. And so there are pools and pockets and sometimes thicker drapes of uh, sediment on top of the the seamount. And then those corals and sponges and such often as they die create rubble um, that also serves as a substrate. The slopes are variable, the current patterns can be really strong in some places, and as I said before, uh, endemism on some of these seamounts. Okay, so this yellow box here uh, surrounds the seamounts that might research group was interested in. And so you see the New England seamounts are this long chain right here in the upper right corner of the box, this cluster in the lower, uh, sorry, upper left. Uh, the lower right is the corner rise. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about this little seamount here known as Muir. It's actually part of the Bermuda rise, but uh, because of weather delays, we ended up diverting there during one of the cruises and did quite a number of 
dives there. Okay, so the New England Seamounts, there's at least 34 that qualify as Seamounts, and the shallowest one is either Greg or San Pablo, and that one peaks at 900 meters below the surface, so you can see that they're pretty far down at this point. Um, so there's, what, 600 miles plus of them extending from George's Bank. Um, in the North Atlantic, it's the longest seamount chain. The largest one is a 13,500 foot mountain. Now these were all discovered in uh, 1955 when Woods Hole Oceanographic started using uh, the single beam sonar to try and map out the bottom topography. And during a couple cruises that went out to the Mid-Atlantic Ridge to study the geology of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, um, geologists were interested in the seamounts themselves and they did a couple uh, cruises where they stopped with the sub Alvin and studied those. Now the geologists weren't interested in the biology and so if you read the reports like I have, they'll say, oh yeah, we saw coral and there was a sea cucumber. And that might be it for the entirety of the report. So they didn't talk about anything. The corner rise seamounts, even less well known by the US, however, uh, the Russians and some of the Soviet bloc countries opted to start doing deep sea fishing there in the 1970s through uh, 1992 when the Soviet Union collapsed. And so those areas were heavily fished and the Russians wrote up a good number of reports about the sorts of things that were bycatch in their fisheries. And then I mentioned Muir Seamount, which has uh, several peaks and is over closer to Bermuda and is not part of the hotspot chain that uh, the New England Seamounts are. So all these Seamounts in the red boxes are the various Seamounts that we've now uh, personally investigated, uh, either with ROVs or with submersibles uh, since the start of this project. Uh, and, and so you see we've covered a good chunk of the, uh, the New England Seamount chain here and most of the corner rise as well and near. So what's interesting about this hotspot is that it is a long-standing hotspot. It actually got its start in the early Cretaceous up here around Montreal in what's known as the Monteregian Hills. And as the North American plate was moving, the hotspot remained relatively uh, stationary and formed some volcanoes in the White Mountains. There's probably some evidence of them underneath George's Bank, but very covered by sediment. The first of the New England seamounts is right on the continental slope of George's Bank, and that's Bear Seamount. And then the rest of the seamounts extend out. Bear is 110 million years old, so it's about mid-Cretaceous. And Nashville, which is the easternmost uh, New England seamount, is about 80 million years old. Um, and then the corner rise here, this cluster is the continuation. The, the plate shifted a little bit in its orientation, and so the direction that the seamounts ran in uh, changed. And the corner rise are roughly around 70 million years old, and so that puts them around the end of the Cretaceous. The Great Meteor Seamount and associated seamounts on the other side of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge are some of the other remnants, more recent remnants of the uh, hotspot. And currently, the hotspot that created all of these seamounts and, and volcanoes is under West Africa and has been relatively um, docile. So there hasn't been any sort of volcanic activity there yet. Now I said that the shallowest of the seamounts is still about 900 meters below the surface, but the Gulf Stream here runs through that area. And you see how the Gulf Stream starts to meander here from New England? That's because the tops of those seamounts are tickling the bottom of the Gulf Stream itself. Typically, that runs down to about 1,000 meters in depth. So because of that friction, uh, all these meanders get formed. And this 
the seamounts themselves are what are responsible for creating all of the warm core eddies that tend to cycle back towards the uh, Atlantic seaboard from southern New England to New Jersey and all. So, as I said, geologists had investigated it in the 60s and early 70s and really didn't say anything about the biology. So, up until about 1995, virtually nothing was known about the biology on these seamounts. And in 1996, I was contacted to help identify deep sea fishes that were coming from a number of commercial fishermen who had received SK or FIG grants to explore the possibilities of deep water fisheries in the New England area. NOAA, uh, National Marine Fisheries Service, was thinking that maybe we could shift some displaced fishermen to other resource extraction uh, in the deep sea. So one uh, fisher was a, a longliner who was actually collecting on bare seamount, and they kept getting bins and bins of fishes that they didn't know what to do with. And, and so uh, they finally contacted me to identify the species that they were collecting. And I identified seven different things that were getting, they were getting in their long lining. And that pretty much was the list of fishes for bear seamount. Um, but I got interested in bear seamount and realized that uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic or Hui had these old photos from the 60s and 70s uh, expeditions to uh, the New England Seamounts. And so I went to their archives and I actually went through all of the camera reels that they had for the different Alvin dives on the New England Seamounts. And from those, I identified at least 50 species of invertebrates, another eight species of fishes. And that was enough information for me to start contacting people at NOAA and saying, you know, if you're going to do fisheries on bear seamount, you really need to know what else is there if you're going to regulate the fishery. And so they agreed to do a couple cruises in 2000 and 2002 and pelagic trawling, bottom trawling, uh, to see just what we could find. And from those two cruises, we got over 400 species of invertebrates and fishes. And this uh, got written up in a couple of papers, and uh, we basically said that there's a lot of diversity down there. This is not some barren area, so uh, really needs to be investigated some more. Now, by that time, I was now working as a postdoc at National Marine Fisheries Services uh, Science Center in Woods Hole. And so all I had to do was walk like about three blocks down the street in Woods Hole itself and talk to Lauren Molino, who's a invertebrate uh, zoologist uh, interested in deep sea larval recruitment at, at uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic. And so she and I talked and a number of other people got involved in this and eventually we put together a research consortium to start looking at the, uh, the seamounts. So these are just some images that uh, gleaned from those uh, camera rolls from the 60s and 70s. And so you can see clearly some corals in each of these images. There's some uh, urchins in here and other things as well. And this is uh, the stern of the Delaware II, which was the NOAA fisheries vessel that we were able to use for those 2000 and 2002 cruises. And this is actually hauling the net in and everyone's checking the mesh the wing on the wings of the net because there were a lot of deep water organisms that got caught by their teeth or by their tentacles, for instance, in the, the wings of the net. And they weren't at the end, the cod end. And so we, we basically pulled the net in slowly and picked everything off of the nets as we were going. And these are the sorts of things that we got from those uh, early cruises, the bottom trawls and pelagic trawls around uh, air seamount. So this is a diversity of different crustaceans, everything from uh, squat lobsters and blind lobsters here to 
fairly large shrimp. One of the commercial fishermen that got the grants in the, in the late 90s was actually fishing this particular thing known as a royal red shrimp, Plesio pineus. And uh, he was making a business out of it for several years. So there were some potential commercially viable things. Uh, sea stars that we saw. Here's a trays of sorted fishes, everything from cutthroat eels to spiny eels to um, uh, zoarcid and small skates and all sorts of other things. The diversity was incredible. And some of our, our trawls just brought back um, really rare things. Uh, this is one of my favorites. This is the ooze eel right here, which loves to burrow in the, the muddy substrate. And a number of grenadiers here, which are also a potentially harvestable commercial fish. So our research consortium, we called ourselves Mountains in the Sea, um, decided that we were going to do a number of things. Now, most of my collaborators were uh, coral biologists, and so you'll see these objectives are very, very heavily oriented towards corals. And so mapping out corals and other organisms, reproductive uh, state, larval strategies, colonization dynamics and coral aggregations, seamount animals, you know, whether they're genetically isolated uh, and therefore potentially endemic versus more widespread. And uh, one guy was using fossil corals to reconstruct paleoceanographic conditions. And so he could radiometrically date a fossil coral and then use things like the um, Delta 018 uh, isotopes to tell what the water temperatures were at that time. And so he could construct current flows and uh, other things from the, the sorts of information that he was generating. Ron Brown was one of the vessels we used uh, as well. Um, our Mountains in the Sea research group received funding for a number of cruises and the Ron Brown was one vessel we used for ROV operations. We actually bolted down a couple of uh, containers on the back deck that were the uh, operations uh, vans for running the ROV and just dropped the ROV off the, uh, the back deck there. One of the first things we learned was that we had to basically create our maps of these various seamounts. Using the seawater altimetry from the satellites, you could get rough maps like this. And so this is actually the map of near seamount based on the way the seawater was elevated above different parts of the seamount. But that's not a very good um, portrayal of the seamount especially given the, uh, oh, that's roughly about 40 miles. So what we had to do was our own mapping. Now the Navy had better maps, but they weren't releasing them because they were used for military purposes. Um, if you've ever seen the movie uh, Hunt for Red October, they talk about Red Route 1, which was a way for Russian subs to get to the Atlantic coast of of uh, the US, especially the Northeast. Well, Red Route 1 runs through the New England seamounts, and the Navy had already done high resolution maps of all the seamounts and had put hydrophones out on some of the seamounts to listen for Russian subs coming through Red Route 1. But we had to do it all over again because they weren't releasing those, those were classified. So what we have is multi-beam sonar on vessels like the, the Ron Brown, and we had to mow the lawn over various features in order to create these maps. Now the resolution on the multi-beam that we were using was very high. Um, it couldn't distinguish things that were less than a meter apart, but anything greater than a meter, we could get um, to, topographic information. So 
This is a map generated from the multi-beam sonar, and the black line here represents uh, the pathway that Alvin uh, drove around during one of its eight-hour dives. So this is after the fact, but we use these maps to plan where to go. And this particular little knoll here looked interesting and had some topographic features that indicated maybe there were large amounts of coral there. So that's eight hours of driving on the bottom. This little red box right here is that previous map, just to give you a sense of the scale and the level of detail. And this is the box for the previous map. And so our eight hours of driving was one little pimple right here in this saddle between the two peaks on Muir Seamount. And we managed to do, uh, I think it was about six dives there. So even though we saw different parts of Muir Seamount, we saw less than 1% of the entire structure. So there's a lot more exploration that could be done, especially um, the difference between something like this versus something like that. Okay, so here's Kelvin Seamount again, and you can see the uh, differences in elevation here, and a sort of plateau top. The reason for that flat top on this seamount is that back when it was young, it was really hot, and thermal expansion meant that it was much closer to the surface, and during the Oligocene low sea level stands, it looks like these seamounts got eroded down to uh, the water's uh, surface at that time. And so there's, there's evidence that uh, these seamounts were probably higher peaks originally when they first formed, but got eroded at the upper surfaces. And the sort of scalloped edges that you see in some of these places, those represent um, Turbidite flows, basically landslides, where portions of the seamount collapsed and created a debris fan out here in the deeper abyssal depths. And you can see rotating this a bit more. Each of those scalloped edges here represents a collapse of a portion of the original seamount uh, side. And these fans here of debris down below represent the material that came from those uh, landslides. Okay, so in order to plan out our dives, we had the multi-beam maps, but we also wanted some visuals as to places that looked pretty good or potentially good. And so we had a camera sled that we also would deploy at night and drag around uh, while we were multi-beaming uh, to figure out what things look like. And so this is on the plateau surface of one of the seamounts. And each of these pink and white things is a Gorgonian fan. Um, we found most of those were in the genus Paragorgia. And some of them turned out to be really huge. Once we got down there with ROVs and subs and such, a big fan like this would be nine or 10 feet high. This material here represents sponges and other encrusting organisms and some big basalt uh, chunks just sitting there. Uh, we also deployed an AUV to sort of uh, increase how much time we could photograph at night on the bottom. So um, this is Abe. Abe was released uh, at night with a pre-programmed uh, area to photograph and create similar sorts of look down imagery. And so we could see like certain areas that were mostly sediment covered and were not very good for the coral studies that my colleagues wanted to do. And so we ended up avoiding a lot of those and deploying either the ROV or the sub to go to these uh, various sites. So this is launching the ROV Hercules. Uh, Hercules was on loan from Bob Ballard, um, who had used this to do some of the specials on you know, returning to the Titanic and such. And so we got to run that, uh, that ROV 
for Bob Ballard to test upgrades and things that he had done to the ROV before he started filming one of those Titanic specials. The camera slid here, Jason, uh, following behind, and there's a soft tether here between the two, and that soft tether means that the movement of the ship is not transferred to the ROV. You could see the camera sled sometimes just sort of rising and falling in the water column as the ship itself was moving at the surface. But the soft tether meant that uh, the ROV could remain really, really stable. And uh, at one point, uh, one of the scientists said, could you move the ROV just a smidge? And the pilot was like, well, what's a smidge? And the scientist said, well, how much control do you have? How fine can you move it? And the pilot said, one centimeter. So the degree of, of control was really fine. And that allowed us to do a great deal with uh, the ROV at depth. Here's the pilot station. You can see all the different cameras on the ROV that they can view as well as the main uh, camera in front. The scientist station gets the same looks at the various uh, cameras on the, um, the ROV or the sub and also uh, the hydrographic data that's coming in, water temperature, current flow, things like that. So here's Hercules picking up some basalt blocks that Lorne Molyneux had put out a year before. And what she'd done is some basalt material, the same material that is the lava, the solidified lava of the uh, seamounts, sterilized it and then released them to see what recruits onto those blocks. There are two boxes here on the underside of the uh, the ROV. Those are our bio boxes where the manipulators can pick up things and put them in there and uh, bring them back to the surface. And so this is retrieving the blocks. Here's the blocks inside one of the bio box and uh, just some images of corals recruiting and snails and polychaetes and all sorts of other things. And whenever the ROV came up, um, there was always a gathering of scientists to see what came up in the bio boxes because it was always fascinating first look at the real life of these things that you may have seen on the screens and such. And um, the bio boxes themselves could seal, so they ended up keeping the ambient cold water temperature from the seamount. Uh, inside the box, even though the surface waters might be warmer. And what we did was directly transfer everything to um, chilled seawater um, five gallon buckets and then move those into the um, walk in fridge that was devoted to biological samples. And in that way, we kept the animals alive for an extended period of time while we were doing our various investigations. So here's Scott France, uh, a coral biologist down at uh, University of Louisiana Lafayette. And he was one of the geneticists who was working on uh, looking at whether there was endemism or not, and also uh, interested in the biodiversity of the uh, corals, in this case, a black coral. We also use the sub uh, Alvin for several of these cruises and Alvin, uh, can take three people down. Now, one of them is the pilot, so it's typically two scientists in Alvin. Uh, occasionally, when there's a pilot in training that's going down, it's just one scientist. And deploying Alvin was an extraordinary experience. Riding in Alvin is like being in a spacecraft or a, you know, a plane or something. And they actually talk about uh, the vessel at the surface like this being at so many meters altitude above the target. Uh, the space inside Alvin is not so great. It's about a seven foot diameter sphere of titanium, but everything that can't touch seawater has to be inside. So that means that uh, there's my viewport right here. There's a control uh, up here that gives me a little uh, LED screen to flip between the different cameras that are around the outside. And that's my space. Uh, crouched like that for about eight hours. 
because all this electronic gear is up above you and tanks and emergency gear behind you and all sorts of other things. It's, it's an amazing experience though, to be in a sub down at those depths and to see these things live. And I'll say that although the ROVs can give you like 32 hour continuous dives and Alvin only gives you eight hours, um, being able to see perspective really made me uh, able to understand what I was seeing on the flat screen images much better than those folks who hadn't been down and seen the stuff live uh, quite yet. So here's a basalt ledge. And in these high flow areas, uh, you get a lot of corals and sponges and other filter feeders in abundance. And so this is actually covered with all sorts of solitary corals in here, as well as these Gorgonian sea fans and such. And um, because the coral biologists were interested in all sorts of things, we were sampling. Uh, so here's the manipulator arm going for a coral colony, pick it up and shove it in the bio box. And on to the next one. Um, some of the things that we saw were, were pretty crazy. And given that we were doing videography as well as the still imagery, um, we did see a number of, oh, and this video is not gonna show, oh, I'm sorry. We could see a lot of behavior, and so what happens in this uh, video image is that uh, the, this, what's known as a whiplash squid mastigo toothus magna, um, was taking this sort of hunting posture and then posing and, and moving around in response to the, uh, the sub. Okay. Oh, wait. There we go. So here's the video, and it's deploying the two long tentacles in what is a hunting strategy, but also cautiously eyeing the sub. And so with these videos and clips of different animals, a number of us have been able to write up papers on uh, the behavior of the animals and various movements, various strategies that they're using, and so on. And the squid biologists really enjoyed uh, these sorts of videos. For some of the squid that uh, we did see, it was sometimes the first time that these things had been uh, videoed. And so more than just a, a snapshot. So there's that hunting posture with the two long tentacles strung out. Now this video goes on for like seven minutes and I'm gonna move on. Um, so the stuff that came out of the bio boxes is uh, being analyzed by various scientists uh, who are interested in various aspects of things. Uh, this was one of my undergraduates who came along and we had her basically sifting and sorting all of the fine grain material that was at the bottom of both the bio box and the buckets. And we were creating effectively a com as complete a list of all the invertebrates and fishes that were collected. Um, the ROVs and subs are really, really lousy at collecting fishes. And so for Peter Oster and I, as the two fish biologists in this group, it was mostly the videography and the still images that were providing us with information. But I was also collecting for a number of museums. And so all of these specimens that were sorted out of the bio boxes and such ended up being deposited in uh, different museums, the Smithsonian, the MCZ at Harvard, the Peabody Museum at Yale. And one of the things that I spoke about at a Geological Society of America meeting was the different kinds of substrates that you saw out on these seamounts. And so basalt, of course, was really, really common, given that these are volcanic mountains. 
Any sort of topographic changes creates uh, hydrodynamic currents that enhance uh, zooplankton capture for a variety of uh, planktivores. And so here we've got um, corals and sponges. Here's a soft coral anthomastus. This is a, a filter feeding sea star, actually. It looks like two of them there. Um, Brazingia. And you can see crinoids all over the top surface of this. There's a glass sponge and a sea star that's basically feeding on the um, surface material attached to the, the ledge there. Um, bare basalt outcrops were not the best place to colonize, and so there were some things like these crinoids and also little brittle stars and such that would be found in abundance, occasional bryozoans and other things, sponges and such. But the bare basalt itself was bare for a reason. It was not typically the, the best place unless there was a change in the, the water currents. Um, there were also manganese pavements in certain areas. And so this is actually a fossil algal reef that was found at the top of one of the seamounts. And the black coating is manganese oxide that has precipitated from the seawater itself. And so a lot of things that are exposed to seawater in the deep sea get this sort of dark coloration to it. And Calcium carbonate was a more preferred substrate for a lot of things, so we found a lot more corals and other things attached to um, this calcium carbonate. And there were a number of organisms that the coral biologists were having a great time with. So Metallogorgia here is a parasol gorgonia. And one of the things that uh, was observed with looking at all these Metallogorgia is that there's a snake brittle star all wrapped around here in the center. And there was usually one snake brittle star for every parasol. Um, the only exceptions turned out to be when we found a male and a female snake brittle star together with, uh, in that one parasol. And things were growing on top of other things. Uh, most of this white, Branching coral here is actually a precious coral in the genus Corallium. But you see a white sponge that's covering it, this purple encrusting Gorgonian as well. Um, spiny brittle stars and crinoids uh, that all climbed up on top of this elevated structure because the water flow speed is higher above the surface. And so they're using that. that accelerated water flow to enhance their filter feeding. One of the surprises was out on Manning Seamount, we found what looked like a biological reef structure here that um, we think might be a worm reef. Uh, we did some zoom in close-ups and it's honeycomb with little openings and at least a few of the openings had two tentacles sticking out so it might very well be that this is a polychaete worm reef akin to the kinds of worm reefs that are found in the east coast of Florida for instance. But it was on top of a dike structure, a crack in the, the um, material of the volcano that allowed for newer lava to ooze up. And so this dike, we followed for over a mile, and the worm reef was on top of that for the entire length that we uh, followed it. And the glued together worm reef was pretty strong structurally because this black coral right here, the orange colored coral, is actually, um, like eight or nine feet tall, and was well anchored in the, uh, in the worm reef. Iridigorgia, the sort of corkscrew uh, Gorgonian coral, uh, turned out that there were a number of morphologies that were seen, and uh, folks like Scott France, Les Watling, and such, took a real interest in the different kinds of shapes that they were seeing, and decided to investigate that further, and figured out that 
Originally, there was one species identified from uh, the New England seamounts, but actually there were four. So they, they described three new species of uh, Eridogorgia out there in the New England seamounts. Now, some areas had really high flow uh, rates. And so this particular promontory, uh, you can see it's covered with corallium, the precious coral, and also various sponges and a variety of other things right at the ridge line here that were catching the uh, high current over the, uh, the crest of the ridge. And this promontory we know uh, was over two knots in speed because that was the maximum forward speed of the ROV. And when we rose above the level of the crest, the speed of the water actually blew the, the ROV backwards. And so we had to drop down, move in, do some more close up videography, rise up to do a survey and get blown back again. And on some of these promontories, you could see things like patch reefs. We were ready to call these reefs at the time, even though Noah was much more reluctant to. But you've got Gorgonian coral, sea fans, you've got stony corals in here, you've got sponges of various forms. If this were in some shallow lagoon somewhere, no one would have any problems calling this a patch reef. And looking in closer, here's a couple of the different stony corals that were making up these patch reefs. The pink here and the white skeletons, uh, that's Lophelia, which is a really common deep water, cold water, ahermatific coral. And the lemon yellow here is Analopsamia. And these two uh, uh, genera made up a large share of the stony coral patch reefs that we saw. Uh, out on the New England seamounts and corner rise. Uh, and here's a little glass sponge down tucked in here. And also all these little things here that we call potato chips are a uh, glass sponge as well. And sometimes it was just the beauty of what we were seeing. I was one of the scientists um, on duty at the time that the, this particular video image occurred and I called for a frame grab because just the, the visual nature of this was just stunning. This analopsamia here um, and this candidella gorgonian and all of these little uh, brittle stars all over it. So here's a paragorgia, a lot of brittle stars uh, in the arms of this as well, and a, one great big brisingid sea star. These brisingid sea stars are climbing up to elevated areas the same way that crinoids and uh, brittle stars are in order to get into the higher flow and use their tube feet to actually pluck plankton out of the water. We collected that particular uh, Brazingid, and you can see here, uh, this is 20 centimeters, so about uh, eight inches. And stretching those arms out, this Brazingid sea star was on the order of about two and a half feet wide. Tripod fish, one of the uh, more sedentary fishes that we saw very, very frequently. And looking at the way the fin rays are deployed, you can see that they're using them as almost a, a touch sense for any sort of zooplankton and smaller organisms that were flowing uh, towards the tripod fish. So these fish always faced into the incoming current and use their feelers, these free fin rays, as a way to detect things in their vicinity that they could snap up. Okay, uh, this is a shout out to my wife, Dr. Susan Richardson, who studies foraminifera. And this little mound right here is a xenophyophore. It's a uh, subgroup of foraminifera that glue together these constructed um, tests. And that's a brittle star draped on top of this. So that's about a three inch mound. It's pretty good for a single cell. Um, and I did collect a few of these for her. She did some genetic um, sequencing and 
that showed that xenophyophores are uh, foraminifera. Okay, so some of these coral scapes are really diverse, and you're looking at all this stuff, and there's all sorts of things to catch your eye, like this sponge and all these different uh, paramuricea corals, and the nice little solitary up there. But you know, sometimes the devil's in the details, and so you look right there, and it's like, oh, look at that. There's a little three beard codling right there. Uh, tucked away in amongst all of that riotous invertebrates. And that was the case. Very frequently, we didn't see anything um, as the video was live, but in reanalyzing it later on, uh, details like this would pop out, increase our uh, knowledge of the diversity on these sea mounts and such. This is a pancake urchin, and they were frequently moving out over the silted sediment. And once you're out on the silted sediment, there isn't very much in the way of cover. Now, the urchins are fine. They've got all these spines associated with them. But this little baby cuscule here was making use of these uh, pancake urchins. And actually, not just this one. We saw it many times. And so... This little cuscule was able to wind its way in amongst the spines when the ROV got too close. And that seems to simulate what its response would be to a potential predator. But from a distance, we could see it out and about, staying very close to the urchin, but picking and foraging on food items it wouldn't have been able to have gotten if uh, there weren't this sort of mobile shelter in the form of this pancake urge. A number of other things that we saw, uh, this chimera here, this is a pallid chimera, uh, was an intriguing sight. Uh, we saw them fairly frequently from bare seamount all the way out to uh, the corner rise. But uh, one of the things was that they shouldn't have been there. Um, pallid chimera, uh, this, this uh, Oreo dory here, those are Eastern Atlantic species. And so um, what were they doing in the West Atlantic? And what um, I hypothesized was that they were using uh, things like the corner rise and the New England seamounts as stepping stones to get to an area, a region that they weren't normally known from. And here's a, one of the Oreo dories. Let's see if I can get this to work. Nope. I'm having troubles trying to get this to play. Um, okay, so of the, the various fishes that Peter Roster and I observed out there, um, we started categorizing a number of them as uh, particular types of, of habitat users. And so there were the generalists, like the halosaur spiny eels and the uh, various grenadiers and such, and some of the, the cutthroat eels, like Synaphobrancus, were just pretty much everywhere. Um, the ones that were found only in the basalt habitats included that little Oreo dory. Um, and in fact, some of our videography of that Oreo dory showed that it was using large coral fans like the Paragorgia trees as a central place and foraging out from that and returning to that coral fan as a home base, at least temporarily. And so central place foraging, these Oreo dories were acting like deep sea reef fishes. They were moving around in three dimensional space, much more the way that uh, things like butterfly fishes do and picking at small items on the, the bottom. Uh, there were some that were fine grain sediment uh, organisms, typically found usually on the uh, sediment material and patches. Uh, on the seamounts, and then others that were found at the boundaries between uh, ledges and, and sediment. Uh, so these 
lines right here are rarefaction curves, uh, counting numbers of individuals versus the, um, the various uh, species that we were seeing. And what we found was that uh, we hadn't even plateaued out on these seamounts. So even though we had gone out there uh, more than a dozen times, uh, we still haven't found all of the things that are likely there. It's not until it sort of plateaus out like this that you're confident that you've got most of the more common things and some of the rare things as well. Um, some of the rare things surprised us. And, you know, I shared imagery of some of our fishes with specialists. And so the Joe Caruso, who's a specialist in these um, coffin fish, uh, took one look at that and said, and you know, that's a different species. The eyes are too big for any of the ones that I know of. And, and so we were unable to collect any of them out there, but there is more diversity to be found and described. Okay, so what about conservation of these seamounts? Uh, out in the corner rise here, as I said, there was a big fishery in the 70s through the 90s. Um, by the Russians and various Soviet bloc countries at the time. And now, you know, in 1995, 96, there was exploratory work being done out at Bear Seamount. What were people thinking about in terms of fishery resources? Well, out on the corner rise, there were these Alfonsinos that are a very popular food fish in Europe. And so those were the most marketable thing that they they were collecting out there and selling. Um, bear seamount, the most abundant thing that we were getting were uh, grenadiers. And there is a fishery in the Grand Banks up here in Canada uh, for grenadier. It's not a very high valued cod-like fish, but you could still you know, potentially make a, a living off of those. But one of the things that we realized in some of our uh, studies, especially when we got out to the corner rise in the 2005 cruise, was there was still evidence of uh, trawl damage, like this, these chain marks on uh, some of the basalt. And right here is a big, deep groove, and that's probably the door of an otter trawl that just plowed through the sediment right there. Um, these are marks that had to have occurred from 1992 or earlier, and they still hadn't been colonized or, or obliterated uh, during our 2005 cruise. So what happens in the deep sea lasts for much longer. Um, the US EEZ includes four of these New England seamounts. You've got Bear Seamount, Visalia, Middleus, and Retriever are within the US EEZ. And so we have control over what happens with uh, those seamounts. And after we had seen how much corals and other diversity were out on the seamounts, um, a number of our group uh, tried to advocate for protection of the seamounts from any sort of fishing activities that could be harmful. Now, the long lining was probably less harmful than bottom trawl, so that's, that's a big difference. As far as commercial species go, well, this grenadier was one of the things, the precious corals were seen by some of the coral biologists as another potential thing. And then we saw uh, red crabs out there, and there already was a fishery for red crabs in uh, New England. But it's not a very high value meat, and so it's hard to justify uh, that. What everyone was hoping for was this thing right here, orange ruffy. If orange ruffy could have be found on the uh, New England seamounts, then that could have been a huge fishery. Um, we didn't find orange ruffy, and in fact, the northernmost, oh, sorry, the southernmost occurrence of orange ruffy on the West Atlantic is off of uh, Nova Scotia. So we had uh, proposed blocking off this area around the seamounts and saying, you know, let's make this a a no-take zone uh, or marine protected area 
the New England Fisheries uh, Council decided to table that proposal because there just wasn't enough commercial fishing occurring yet out on the seamounts for them to say, well, we should protect some of this. But then in 2016, President Obama designated those four New England seamounts and three canyons that had been heavily investigated by Woods Hole Oceanographic as uh, national monuments. So it's the Northeast Canyons and Seamounts Marine National Monument. And so those are now protected areas from any sort of um, intensive fisheries that could damage the, the bottom habitats and, and organisms. Okay, um, like I said, this was a research group. And so these are some of my uh, colleagues and collaborators in the uh, Mountains in the Sea group, as well as uh, folks from other institutions who uh, helped with a great deal of the collection and identification of organisms, and other taxonomic experts that uh, helped with invertebrate groups that I had no uh, skills at really identifying. And through their help, you know, we did publish several species lists. And I'm working on a new paper that is going to be the final list of fishes from the New England seamounts. Um, so stay tuned. And with that, I say thank you very much. <laughs> so I suppose we can open things up to questions if anyone's interested. Yeah, if anybody has any questions for John, um, can ask them now. Hey, John, uh, can you hear me? Yes. That's Tim Collins. Hi, how are you doing? <laughs> good, good. So I had a question for you. Um, those things that you thought might be a vermeated reef, I mean, uh, rather a, a, a polyphenol Like a satellite reef. reef, yeah. Yeah, I wonder, I wonder if that, they might be vermeated. So has anybody actually identified those? No, we never got a chance to take a sample of the reef itself, and we didn't end up collecting the, um, the worms. And so all we have is the videography. And it was really just two little tentacles sticking out of the, uh, the openings. Right. Well, so I'm thinking that my, those might be the little pedal tentacles that vermeated feed out to send out their mucus nets. Well, I mean, the videography is archived. And so um, it's free for folks to take a look at if, if they want. Uh, if and, you're and it's online somewhere? Uh, let me see. The videography for that was saved at Woods Hole. So I think there, it's in the archives at Woods Hole. Uh, also, the University of Connecticut, um, their marine station has an archive set. All right. Well, thanks. Enjoyed your talk. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Hey, John. Um, I was wondering about your the stepping stone hypothesis that you had. Um, mm -hmm. What would be, what do you think could be driving the, the movement of those chimeras across the Atlantic Ocean from one seamount to another? Well, both the chimeras and the Oreo Dory were known from the mid Atlantic Ridge. And so the corner rise and some of the um, the various seamounts associated with the western side of the mid-Atlantic Ridge could have provided just, you know, places to colonize and they just uh, progressively colonized further and further west. Now, I mean, this has probably happened you know, a long time ago. It's hard to say just when exactly they reached the west side of the uh, Atlantic Basin, but we do have some videos of things like that Oreo Dory in one of the Continental Slope Canyons from the 1970s. So this is not a recent thing. It's probably something that happened and they just haven't spread very much from their points of contact.
Any other questions for John? Hey, John, I have a quick question. I uh, was just wondering uh, what sort of um, sharks uh, you saw, if any, over the seamounts. Oh, yeah. We, we saw and collected quite a number of things. Um, quite a few Apristurus. They're really abundant in the, uh, the seamount peaks. Um, so Apristurus profundum, Apristurus manus, those were the more common ones. Uh, there were a couple other Apristurus. Uh, what other sharks? Um, the black dogfish. Uh, Centrocilium. Um, we did see one or two at Mopterus. Uh, one of the things about the sharks, though, was that they seemed to react to the noise that the ROV made. And, and so typically what we did was drop the ROV down, kick on the lights, turn on the thrusters, and as soon as the thrusters and lights came on, the sharks were heading out of there. They were gone in in less than a minute after the dive had started. And we rarely saw sharks during the dives. I think there's one Apristurus that, that came in and gave a show. But mostly what we saw were shark butts on the way out of the frame. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I can, uh, I'll just Jump in with a very quick question, uh, John. That was a great talk. Thanks a lot. Um, anybody who's tried to do an experiment underwater, even if it's at 15 feet, knows how hard it is. And I'm sure at some point you or people in the team are going to want to go, you know, beyond the the very important biodiversity documentation and and do some manipulative experiments. Ideally, I just wonder whether you could talk a little bit about whether that's even feasible, or you know, how frustrating it is not to be able to do those kind of experiments. <laughs> I'm just thinking about the uh, the mechan the logistics of, of doing science in the deep sea. Right. And the logistics are such that, I mean, we had that really big consortium of co-PIs so that we could justify um, financially the cost of the vessel and the subs and such. To run a big vessel like Atlantis is $20,000 a day. To run the sub off the back end is another $10,000 a day. So you're talking about some serious money and, and the funding agencies really want to see as much science done as possible. So having um, a diversity of folks who are looking at fossil corals and living corals and fishes and invertebrates and what have you is one way to get that done. It does mean that you know dive time is split, and so like that one dive to drop the um, the salt blocks out was good in the sense that the the bio box was then freed up once the basalt blocks were were deployed. But upon retrieval, that took up one entire bio box, and so that was one dive where the amount of material that could be collected besides the blocks was cut in half. And so you make those compromises in working with a, a collaborative group. But yeah, it's expensive science and there's only so many vessels and subs that can go down and do that kind of work. I mean, on the East Coast, Alvin's the only sub. You've got human operated sub. And uh, there are a few ROVs that can go down to those depths. We took Hercules down to 4,500 meters. So hopefully that answers your question. Any other questions for John? I have a quick question slash comment. Um, as being a, a fellow, uh, well, very <laughs> new to science scientist who also likes to dabble in a bunch of different things and cannot seem to focus, what suggestions do you have for scientists like me who are more of a generalist than a specialist? Um. It does help to make some sort of specialty. 
uh, and so my specialty was deep sea fish and uh, that helped secure my postdoc and I ended up evaluating these deep sea fishery resources for National Marine Fishery Service as part of my postdoc. But it's okay if you're doing the side gigs as long as the, the main area is, is maintained. So uh, yeah, and as I've gotten older and have more time to uh, cultivate other side gigs, uh, I've managed to uh, generate more outside projects from you know, deep sea fishes. Um, Having those side gigs is really good at times because for instance, um, there was a few year period where I was having troubles getting the funding to do at sea science. And I tidied myself over uh, by doing things like, uh, believe it or not, an endangered lichen survey in Florida. And there's, there's one species of endangered lichen down here. And uh, my wife and I went out and surveyed all of the sites where it, it might be one summer. And you know, that was grant support for that little dry spell in deep sea research. Thank you very much for the input. You're welcome. Anything else? Uh, so I think, I think Matt, I can see <laughs> Matt's on mute. So I'll just jump in and ask if there's one final round of questions. Otherwise, uh, thanks again for uh, kicking off our marine science series and um, uh, we can uh, let you get on with the rest of your day. Okay. Yeah, I'm not hearing everything. So uh, thanks everybody for attending. We uh, will also post this um, for people to, uh, the recording for people to watch at another time, for those who can make it to that. So thanks again, John. Thank you Thank very you. much, folks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. If you have any other questions, feel free to email me. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, John. You're welcome.